Well, let's get started. Let's get started. Um, it's 626. That's close enough, right? <clears throat> okay. I just wanted to say welcome to everyone who's here. I'm Heather Wilson. I'm the Deputy Director at the Cameron Art Museum. And we're so pleased you're joining us tonight for our first Art and Social Justice series. Um, joining me today are Stephen Hayes. He's the artist for our USCT Sculpture Project. Um, we also have Sonia Patrick, who is a USCT descendant, and her son Josiah, who is also a descendant, um, and Joel Cook, who's a reenactor, and Anne Brennan, who is the executive director at the Cameron Art Museum. And so we're just gonna have a conversation today um, about the USCT project. I think most of you probably know about it, but for some of you, it might be your first time learning. Uh, the sculpture will be installed in November of 2021. We've been working on it for a while now. It's, um, it's been a longstanding dream of ours to have a work of art um, by an African-American artist um, on the Civil War site uh, that kind of bridges the art museum with our historic site that we're stewards of. Um, so we're excited that you're here and we're excited to talk about it. Um, so I just, I would like to take a moment just to introduce everyone and to tell you a little bit about the people who are here. Um, Stephen Hayes is of course the artist. He's a Durham born artist who is the Brock family visiting instructor in studio arts in the Department of Art, Art History and Visual Studies at Duke University. His work has been featured at the National Cathedral, at Winston-Salem State University, Duke University, Cam Raleigh, the Rosa Parks Museum, the African American Museum of Philadelphia and the Harvey B. Gantt Center among others. He is the recipient of the 2019 North Carolina Arts Council Emerging Artist Award. He has attended residence at the McCall Center for the Visual Arts in Charlotte and the Halcyon Arts Lab in Washington, D.C., among others. Welcome, Stephen. We're glad you're here. You. I'd also love to introduce Sonia Patrick, who most of you know. She's from Wilmington. Um, she and her son, Josiah, are descendants of four USCT soldiers, Corporal Dennis Perkins, Corporal James Perkins, Private Henry Williams and Corporal David Jackson. Sonia has dedicated her life to fighting for social justice and change within the political, medical, and educational systems. She currently is a community organizer who holds various offices on the national, state, regional, and county level. Welcome, Sonia. And last but not least is Joel Cook. He's a reenactor in the 34th USCT and his voice which I just think is amazing, will be featured on the audio recording component that goes with Stephen's sculpture. Um, he is a graduate of Fayetteville State University with degrees in history and intelligence studies and is currently earning his master's in underwater archaeology from East Carolina University. He is fascinated by Af American history from the Civil War up to the First World War and he performs both American Revolution and Civil War living histories. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the project. I'll ask some questions and then after our conversation, we'll have a chance for you, some of the participants, to ask questions in the chat box. Um, so as you all know, the Cameron Art Museum is the steward of the Battle of Forks Road historic site. Um, this was a significant skirmish that led to the fall of Wilmington. There were 1600 brave USCT soldiers that fought here. They were fighting not only for the United States of America, a cause we all share, but they were also fighting for their own freedom and the freedom of their families. And it is this story that we're going to tell with the sculpture. Um, I wanted to start it off with Anne. Anne, if you could tell us a little bit about the decision to put a work of art at the Battle of Forks Road um, and what led you to work with Stephen. My pleasure, Heather. We're so grateful to all of you spending some precious moments together with us this evening. Um, as stewards, um, that means we, we take care. We, we are passing through. We're all just passing through, but there are, there are charges upon us in passages in our life to take care and to pass on responsibly. And that's the, one of the remarkable jobs of a museum 
So traditionally, as an art museum, we take care of artwork. We take care of the culture of our region. We're, we're very involved with, with material object care and interpretation of those objects. But here on this site, we were given this land, it's a nine and a half acre site, to build a new museum, which we opened in 2002. But we knew that we were building on what was absolutely sacred ground. We knew that men fought here and that men died here. And there was very little otherwise that we actually knew. But that broadened the responsibility upon us with that care and interpretation. And the story of, of Forks Road, this sacred ground, is about the men that Heather just very compassionately told us of. It is, yes, a story of Confederates and Union soldiers fighting in the skirmish that led to the fall of Wilmington, but the predominant story are those men on the front lines on the Union side that were all U.S. colored troops. That clearly is the focus of this story. And with our work in the care of artwork and in the um, creation of new work, commissioning new work, of course, to combine art and the site made all kinds of, of sense. Um, our choice with working with Stephen, oh my heavens, Stephen's work makes us weep. Um, Heather was extremely involved with um, this project coming to fruition we wrote to the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation for a grant to commission a serious young artist. And you heard the accolades that Stephen bears already. He's so young and he, has, he just continues to grow from strength to strength with his work. We were overcome by the physicality of his mode of production. We knew to tell the story of the US colored troops, it needed to be figurative, we investigated in short order abstraction or something more symbolic and thought, no, the starting point was, was naturalism, figurative, and we wanted the prestige and the, um, the honor and the historicity of working in bronze. It's a medium that has documented cultures and defined cultures for over 5,000 years. And so we knew we wanted to work with bronze. And so Stephen's method of working, it's so raw and so accessible and true for this story. There was no doubt that he, if he would say yes, he was the artist that we would, that we would hope to work with and now have the honor to work with. Thank you. Um, I know that when I, first saw Stephen's work, I had a, an immediate kind of visceral, visceral emotion, emotional reaction to Stephen's work, but, the, but it's also so cerebral and thoughtful too. Um, Stephen, I'd love to hear about the USCT project in your own words. Um, what about the story, the story of the United States Colored Troops appealed to you as an artist? Well, I think there's more of like not knowing much about the story in the beginning, you know, as a kid, you know, you, you hear about the Civil War or, you know, different wars, but you don't, they don't go into like the super history behind it, you know, how many people fought in it, the people that, dog, that died. Um, so when you all approached me about the, you know, to create a monument for, for this space, I was like, man, you know, it'd be great, you know, to try and create something that will speak towards, um, these men that walk that march through there. Um, so uh, when I got the information, all the information that Ann sent me, that the videos, the books, and all that stuff, I was like, I was like, yeah, of course I got to do this. I, I have to come up with something that's going to capture everybody's minds and want them to want to, you know, visit the site and and do research about um, the USCTs that march through there. Um, so that's. You know, at the end of the day, I want to I want to wow my audience, but I also want to pursue, make them want to to visit these sites and you know understand the history that came through um, the different areas or the subject matter that I'm working on. Absolutely, 
Um, so I have an image of the artist rendering um, that I'm putting up on the on the screen right now. And Stephen and Anne too, I, I'd love it if you could talk about, so the project has evolved, um, of course, um, over our, our journey working with Stephen. And I wonder if you could talk about that, how it's evolved and changed um, and, and what, what it has become. Well, we, we have, since 2006, our journey interpretively started with um, living history programs held as close to the anniversary of the, of the Forks Road skirmish as possible. The battle was fought February 20th, 21st, 1865, well, 42 days before Appomattox. And so we have invited our reenactors all of these years to come uh, pitch their tents, build campfires on the site, and to to narrate through living history and reenact the skirmish, along with other interpretive programs. And so when we met Stephen and, and he seemed to be interested in the project, we invited him to come to, it was much smaller scale, but we invited him here upon the anniversary when we had several reenactors here so he could absorb their remarkable um, motivation. My goodness, these, the reenactors are truly the keepers of our story. They are living historians, embodying so much the story of, of the men who fought here. And we wanted Stephen to just walk the grounds, talk with the men and their families, touch the soil, and, and get inside the site in his way. I mean, of course we had ideas, but he's the artist. And so Stephen, you wanna share some, some of your experiences that, that first trip here? So, so my first trip there, I was allowed to meet, to meet the reenactors. And uh, it was amazing just to see like the moments and the time, the time how they had to, you know, load the barrels, load the cannons and everything and how they, pitched their tents and the food they ate, um, which all of these different scenes that played out while I was there helped guide me to figure out how I wanted to create the sculpture or what the sculpture was going to end up being. Um, and then also the videos that Ann sent me showed, showed the fort that was made where they, where they stood their ground you know, um, on that site. So allowing me to be able to walk the site and figure out where exactly they wanted the monument or the sculpture to be um, helped me tremendously to, to just envision where I wanted to go with the sculpture. Um, I mean, we went through a few, a few different drawings, you know, a few different ideas until we landed on the one. So, yeah. Would you mind talking about the, the Federal Point Road path I, um, and, and, and how that informed so sound, the sound as well as sight for you. So seeing the path and knowing the amount of like time it took them or mileage that they took for them to walk, you know, they didn't ride horses or in cars or anything. They they walked the whole the whole thing, you know, the whole fight. They walked, they marched, and just imagine like how their feet were or how, what kind of shoes they used to to walk this to walk this this battle. Um, made me think about, you know, just seeing that ground, it made me think of like, man, these shoes would tell a big story. And originally I was thinking about just doing a ton of shoes, like a ton of, of the shoes that they marched in and bronze and having to walk down that fork, walk down that path. Um, but then I, you know, realized that, hey, you know, you're not showing the visual, more, I need more visuals. And, you know, I wanted to add the faces to it and the bodies. But not only that, I want to create the sound, you know, what, what were they chanting? What were they marching to? What, were, what kept them being strong and brave together? together. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to use the voices of, these, of the reenactors of what was the cadence that they went through? What, what are they saying? What kept them going? You know, what was the conversations going on during this march? Mm -hmm. So uh, I ended up talking to Ann and Heather and saying, hey, I would like to record the audio of the reenactors like marching and, and singing to couple it with the sculpture to give it a more 
more body, more full body to this, this whole monument. And that to me was one of the most compelling, um, compelling things about Stephen's work, his, his interest in, in, in bringing in the audio component to the sculpture. Um, not only would we have the figurative representation of these soldiers, but also to be able to hear them chanting and singing and marching. Um, to me, that was really inspiring and fresh and new. Um, and I, I thought could help the viewer to see this in a, a different kind of way. I want to show everyone the back of the sculpture. So on the back, um, Steve, Stephen, can you talk a little bit about your decisions with the back of the sculpture? So the back of the sculpture is going to have the names of all the soldiers that marched through Wilmington. Um, so it's going to be a silhouette on one side. On the other side, you'll see the full body. But um, the silhouette is going to be all engraved, the names of all the soldiers that marched through there. And then um, you'll see the drummer boy and the flag bearer in the full round. But the nine, there'll be nine other soldiers that'll be, that you'll see the silhouette of. <laughs> and we're working right now, um, we put out a call for volunteers and if any of you here are interested, um, we already have 25 volunteers who are helping us to go through muster rolls. Um, they're working with fold3.com and they're finding the names of these men um, that until now we haven't known their names. Uh, we've only known that there were 1600 men and it's really exciting work. Uh, so we're really, we're, we're just thrilled about this. I wanted to ask a question um, to both Stephen and Anne about the role of art in social justice. Um, you both um, talk about, you know, what this sculpture can do for our community. Um, what do you think the role of art is in the pursuit of social justice? S Stephen, you want to take the lead? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I feel art plays a role in, in, in life in general. Um, art can, is a means to create conversation, you know, to allow different people, different races to come together. You know, we have different ways of life. We come from different backgrounds. Art plays a role to create this communication, this way to unite one another. You know? Absolutely. So, um, that's, that's how I feel art is. I, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I want to be able to create a piece of artwork that's either going to change somebody's life or open their eyes to, you know, create a change, you know, so mm -hmm. that's what art does. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Anne, is there anything you'd like to add? <laughs> it's also its job to be disruptive yeah. in the most productive way. Yeah. As Stephen said, it's to get us talking to one another, con conversing. And if it's, as we all know, this extraordinary period in world history we're going through right now with communities all over, definitely this country, looking at what their built environment, what their homes are looking like, what the built environment of where we live how it represents our value systems. Yeah. Is it reflecting who we are? And resoundingly, we're finding maybe not. Yeah. And that is what's going on is highly disruptive in the most extraordinary way. And we know this work of art has now entered that narrative for all of us. And we're excited, we're worried for it from, from us, the stewardship, getting back to taking care of it, because I think it's going to, um, it's going to cause many of us to ask, to confront some hard questions within our own hearts and our own souls. And hope and the art, if we will let it, will help us push through and, and talking with one another about it as well. Um, and we're, we're very pleased to have positioned this work, at least in the continuum of public art. Again, back to the medium of bronze, 
because it's so prestigious, it's so traditional, it's so time honored that we wanted it seated in that um, idiom or genre, um, hopefully to help make it more accessible. You know, we've got the stock inventory about what we expect sculpture to look like. And maybe if it's not too radical in its form, it, it is more accessible for us. Furthermore, this work is going to be situated on the ground, on the path. The soldiers, Stephen's soldiers, Stephen's strong, solid men will be marching on the very same road that the actual men marched on. We're not putting them up on a pedestal and that's not because they are not exalted. That is not because in our mind, they aren't the heroes, the most courageous of the courageous, but we want the accessibility. We want the public to touch the work. We want the public to feel a re-knowing within themselves of the work. And we're very excited to see which areas might become more worn faster than others. Think of the sculptures that you love in life, um, the tales on the lions at the New York Public Library, the tales are worn. Are people going to be touching the drummer more? Are they going to be touching the hand of the color bearer? I think, I think there's going to be an intimate um, communication even through touch with the public. We hope to, and hopefully it will be a careful touch. Absolutely. Stephen, one of the things that I find so um, compelling about your work is um, your depiction of bodies. Um, so much of your work has to do with black bodies and how they are represented. Cash crop in particular is so powerful. There's something very emotive about seeing the life cast you've made of individuals' bodies that makes the intensely personal someone's body become almost universal. And it's a reminder of our shared humanity. I'd love to hear you talk about that, what your intentions are in your work, not just in this USCT sculpture, um, but in your other work where you often use um, people's bodies, um, how you explore bodily rep representation and how that promotes social justice. Yeah. So uh, as an artist, my artwork deals with capitalism, consumerism, and brainwashing, and the ideas of, of the Black body and how the Black body is being represented today. Um, basically, I'm, you know, a lot of my work comes from, you know, me growing up as a kid, you know, and um, seeing, um, seeing people who look like me on television and want to be like them, and then changing my mind as an adult or as a young, as a young man and thinking about those guys were supposed to be like, you know, mentors or somebody I looked up to, but it's what they are being represented as on television was not what I wanted to be. And saying that, you know, when I go travel overseas and how, you know, how people see me, you know, because of what they see on television, you know, uh, I didn't, I don't, I want to change how I'm being seen, you know, on television or being represented on a day to day. I want to be, I want to show an example to other kids who look like me, hey, so choose a different path, you know. Um, so, as far as with my artwork, I want to create a, a way of telling these kids that they don't have to be a pawn, that they can be a king and they can create their own path. So uh, me using the body in my work, you know, because a lot of work that you see as, you know, African-American work, you know, you see them in like a negative light or uh, you'll see like a black person kneeling or in chains or whatever, but, you know, I want to create these conversations about how my body's been seen and how I feel America views me. Um, so when I use the bodies in the work, I I want to draw a way for people to, like, give a cash crop, for example, I cast it life, I cast it life size people, uh, friends and family. And when I put it in a museum setting, I want people to be able to walk through it and, and you know, maybe they'll see somebody look like somebody they know someone they know so uh, it, it creates another conversation of like you know, how does these things still go on or like I know this person or this person could be me 
you know, so that's why I use the body a lot. It, it, it just allows people to, to get another grasp to it or it, it captures them in their heart, you know, in their minds and stuff. So, yeah. One of your favorite, one of my favorite installations of your work is the installation that you did in the National Cathedral. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And you used an audio component there in a very emotive way. Okay, so um, what she's referring to is an installation I created called Voices of Futures Past. And what it did, was, it came, well, the idea came from, well, an incident in my life when I was a kid. Um, I went to uh, two different proper schools. Uh, one focused on English and math, and another one was all the other subjects. But in one of the schools, I was pulled aside, pulled out of the classroom, and to, was told to go to a black guidance counselor's office. Uh, this guidance counselor told me um, that she needs me to apologize to a young Caucasian student. She said that I either, uh, that she thinks I touched her or I sexually assaulted her. And at that time, I'm like, I'm probably like sixth grade. I'm telling her, I don't have a class with this girl. You know, mind you, my classes were about four to five students in the class, and I don't even share a recess with this girl. So me telling her that, she was like, well, you still should apologize to this girl because you're the oldest black student in here and you should apologize because you, you can either go to jail or you go to court and your parents and stuff are getting in some trouble. You go to some trouble. I'm like, well, I still didn't, I didn't do this to this girl. I didn't do anything. So she still like kind of coerced me to just apologize to the student. So at the end of the class, in the school, I ended up seeing the girl and I was like, hey, I'm sorry for whatever you think I did. And then the student looked at me, I laughed and walked away. So <laughs> all my other um, classmates came to me and was like, hey, what happened? I was like, well, she said I sexually assaulted her and I touched her. And they was like, man, you know you didn't do anything. And I was like, yeah, I know. But, you know, that happened so long ago. I never told my mom about that until I was probably like 33 years old mm -hmm. about that instance. And um, so, for for the sculptures that she's talking about as far as voices of futures past what i did was create a safe space to allow the, to allow young men from the ages of 12 to 18 to talk about what how they feel america views them and how they feel they're going through in society what what do they think is going on or have they been put in any kind of situations like this so i created a space safe space to allow them to talk about what's going on with them today. And I archived their voices. So me allowing them to talk about what they're going through, you know, I didn't, I mean, I had my mom to talk to when I was a kid, but that was, you know, I should have said something to her, but I did. So I'm allowing these kids to talk about these things and figure out how can we, how can we get over these things? Not get over, but how can we thrive from these and show this, show this young man how how he should behave or how he should respond back to a situation that he's being put into. Um, so also, there's also a sculpture component to Voices of Futures Past where I casted a bust of older African-American men and um, set them down, did a mold of their full body and then put their, I put them on a pedestal. I put their bodies on a pedestal, their bust. And what I did also put in the voices, I put the voices of these kids inside the bust of these men's bodies. And it's more like a performance piece where people have to walk up to this bust of this African-American man and put their ear to this man's chest to hear what these kids are saying that they're going through. You know, and, and, it's, and it's more of us talking about how can we as older men or men in general be able to help the next generation. That's what Voices of Futures Past is more about. Stephen, thank you so much. I, I love that work so much. Um, I, I want to get back to the USCT project. Um, and, and I was hoping that you could talk about the casting that you did, um, the choice to cast the features of USCT descendants and reenactors, um, the story keepers, um, is incredibly powerful. And I'd like to know how that came about, um, what the significance is of that choice, um, and if you could talk about the process. And, and I do have um, some pictures to show people as well while you talk. Okay. Um, 
in my eyes, I feel like it was more of a no-brainer for me. Like, mm-hmm. I can't just make a sculpture of just men out of my mind. I needed to use, like, the people who are, like, related to these to these men that marched through here. Like, because they have, they still probably have the features of what the soldier once looked like. Um, so I felt like I, I couldn't just make a sculpture of someone, you know, just a random soldier. It, need, it needed to be their relatives, their descendants, um, or even reenactors, just because it gives it more of a human, human quality for you to see the, you know, the texture of this person's face, their skin. Um, and also, these men, their body was on the line. You know, they were here fighting for the freedom of their bodies. So it had to be right for me to use their relatives and put their relatives in this in this in this monument. Um, the process was me. Um, <laughs> I had to put Vaseline over the people's faces and then put plastic gauze over their body to create to create the mold of their body. Afterwards, I poured plaster inside of the mold to get the uh, the positive. So right now, what you see in my hand in, in the image is the negative of the person. And then later on, I'm gonna pour the plaster, in, I will play the, pour the plaster inside of the mold to create the positive. So after I create the positive of their heads, I ended up making the, butt, making the sculptures, um, the bodies of the sculptures or, or the soldiers, and then putting the heads onto the soldiers. And then that's gonna end up being turned into a bronze. So. That's more of the process. Uh, what you see is, so I don't normally do my molds in front of in front of crowds, uh, but you know, for this project, this is something I, know I I had to do. So, what you see in this image is me putting the plaster galls over one of the one of the so one of the future who's going to be a soldier over his body, and then so it takes about a 15, 20 minute process where they have to sit still and I play, place these galls all over each inch of their skin. Um, basically you dip this fabric inside of the water, put it on the skin, you let it sit, and it starts to get hard like a rock stiff. Once it stiffens out, I give them a series of instructions to do while they're inside of the mold. And uh, basically I tell them to smile, raise their eyebrows and flare their nose. This releases the plaster from their skin. Um, also, throughout the process, I'm asking them if they're okay. I, have, you know, hey, are you all right? Because this is a this is a moment where you're basically being mummified, and sometimes people will panic and they'll hear their heartbeat beating inside, in, inside, <laughs> inside the mold. They'll hear their heartbeat beating. I'll tell them ahead of time, hey, you're going to hear your heartbeat in here, so don't panic. It's gonna be okay. I'm still here with you. I'm always talking with them. Make sure, make sure they know that I'm there and they're safe. But um, after that, com- after the shell comes off, it's the negative of their body. And um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people, you know, experience like that panic, that moment, of like it's got to come off. I'm scared. I'm not gonna be able to breathe. But there's no, there's no, there's no straws in your nose or anything. Your nostrils are open. I like to mess with them, tell them, hey, you got to hold your breath the whole time. You know, it's 20 minutes, hold your breath. But, you know, um, for the most part, that you breathe. You can breathe the whole time. Yeah. So that's the process. Here's a couple more pictures. Um, Stephen, what aspect of the sculpture are you most proud of? I'm, at the end, I'm most, I'm be most proud of seeing the end product, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm I'm also proud of being able to cast to cast these people. You know, like it's an honor for me to be a part to be a part of this sculpture and also an honor for me to be able to cast the relatives and these reenactors who are who are basically the stakeholders of this history. To be able to like show to show the life of these people and you know they put their bodies on the line so that I could be free to be able to walk around here today. You know, this is something that we're still fighting over right now, the freedom of our bodies. So um, to be able to reproduce this right here, this, this kind of work is amazing. Can you tell everybody how far you are in the process? Uh, currently we have, uh, 
I have created nine of the sculptures. Um, being that we're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, I'm not able to get into my studio until you know until the school is back open. So they're nine. They're nine soldiers created right now. They're in the bronze. They're in the middle of being uh, casted to turn into bronze. Okay, you have um, two more left to go. Yeah, so I have to do the drama boy and also the uh, the color bear. Um, that'll be the last two sculptures I have to create. Um, once they go, once everything is at the bronze facility, casted in wax, I will do the fine details and everything into the wax, and then it will be turned into bronze. So we're almost there, which almost. is so exciting. What do you hope that visitors come away with? When, when they come to see this, um, what do you hope they take home with them? Uh, just just thinking about what these men went through just to fight for that simple right, a freedom of their body. And, and think about how is that still happening today? What is going on today that they fought for? You know, and, and just thinking about these false myths, these other monuments that are being put up, well, taken down and, you know, and then, creating a monument that's telling the truth or, or something that's for the UFCTs, you know, so, yeah. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask Sonia and Josiah a question. Um, that's okay. We've got Sonia Patrick here and her son, Josiah. Um, you're both USCT descendants. And I wondered if you could tell me, um, Sonia, a little bit about your ancestors. Um, I have actually four ancestors um, that filed as United States Colored Troops. My great grandfather, Private First Class Henry Williams. I had two um, maternal uncles, um, James Perkins Shines, and also Dennis Perkins Shines, who is resting at the um, military cemetery on Market Street. And on my father's side, my great great grandfather, David Jackson, Corporal David Jackson. So I have four that I know of. And I, I, I must say, um, I can't thank the Cameron uh, Museum enough for doing this. Um, it's really emotional to warp some of this. Um, and the artist is just, it's, a, it's emotional just watching his work. His work is just incredible. And it was just an honor to be a part of this and to tell a story that hadn't been told. I mean, how many um, sculptures are there like this in the United States? And they were fighting for the United States of America as well. And they fought hard and they had to deal with certain, um, with very little conveniences, no conveniences as a matter of fact. And, and they fought with their heart and um, very happy that is not only a victory for African Americans, but a victory for the United States of America. Sonia, I, I, I'd like to ask you and Josiah both. Um, we know that um, Josiah's features are going to be in the final sculpture. And Josiah, I'd love to ask you um, <laughs> what that means to you um, and, and what that means to you, Sonia. I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it means a lot because art is like the best way to visualize the past. So I have to be honored to give a, res a visual representation of the legacy that my descendants left behind. And what a better time now when they're trying to rewrite the past with taking down a lot of Confederate statues who are basically fighting to keep things the same versus liberating those who are actually creating change and a lot of the liberties that we enjoy today. So with that being said, just being able to give a visual representation means a lot because luckily I'm fortunate enough that I'm able to have my mother pass down certain stories and different things of my heritage, but having a visual, physical monument and statue, others will be able to walk by and ask questions and then be informed about the sacrifices they made to put us in a position to enjoy many things we do today. Thank you, Josiah. If you could, I think the image of Josiah is the, the last one you just passed. That... We'll go back one. Yeah, that's you, Josiah. Right there? <laughs> yes, sir. Like that. Yeah. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Josiah. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I have one. Well, Josiah, you answered all my questions. <laughs> you did such a great job. Um, I'd like to ask Joel a few questions, if I could. Um, one of the amazing things about the sculpture is, is the audio component. And Joel is a reenactor with the 35th USCT and, and he came and, and he sang and he, he chanted um, and marched for us and we recorded that audio. Um, so Joel, I just, I'd love if you could talk about that process and what you were thinking while, while you were chanting and marching down Federal Point Road. Well, the, I think the thing about, you know, having the uniform on in the first place, like that, that uniform is always going to mean something. Um, so even as a reenactor, like when you put on like the Navy blue jacket and the powder blue pants, like, you know, you, if you're an African American, if you're a black person, you know what it means, you know, whether you reenact or not. Um, so the, the first thing is that it's always an extremely powerful moment just to wear the uniform um, and to, to honor that legacy. And then you have like, for me, I also have, you know, USCT ancestors. So there's that element as well that factors into it. And it factors into it for a lot of the people that are in the 35th USCT. There are a number of us that have a USCT ancestors. Um, so in that particular moment, you know, when you're marching down that road, you know, there's in your head, you're actually, you kind of go there for a moment and like you, you stop hearing the cars going by, you stop noticing that there's a microphone four feet away from you, you know, like that, that stuff kind of goes out the window and you just get into a rhythm with your brothers and you kind of understand what those men were experiencing at that moment. And for me, when I was in that moment, I started thinking about, okay, if I'm singing and like, if I'm marching in the battle, like, how, how do I really feel? Like, how would, it, how would a young soldier really feel, you know, marching into what might have been his first battle or his second battle or, or whatever number? You never stop being afraid of being shot at, you know? So that type, of, that type of process when you're in that uniform and you really get into that moment, is, it's extremely powerful. And to be able to have the opportunity to do that and immortalize that and represent these men in that way is, is, is special. It's really special. Thank you. And so how long have you been reenacting? Uh, this is three years now. I think I started in 2017 or 2016. So four years. Yeah. And, and what do you hope people take away from the experience of seeing the sculpture and hearing that wonderful audio component? I hope that they go and look it up. Yeah. You know, because that's that's something that happens a lot when you talk about like scu historical sculptures in general is that someone will see it and it sparks something for them. Um, and I think that the story of the United States color troops is very underrated. Like we have, you know, one headliner movie, Glory, which came out, you know, a number of years ago. Um, but outside of that, like the story is not one that's like outside of that regiment, the 54th, the story of the United States color troops is not well known. And it's, it's an extremely rich story. There's so many different people and elements that, that factor into that, that. It's like a, you know, it's a tapestry of history. Um, and I hope that when people see this, that they'll take a look and see who is involved. And I've already seen some questions um, in the chat box just here where people are trying to figure out like who, what units were there and like what the names of these people were. So like when you're seeing these names and you're seeing all of this information that will be on this particular monument, I hope that people take that and say, okay, well, maybe I need to go read a little bit more. Maybe I need to go research a little bit more about who these men actually were. Thank you so much. Um, we, I'd love to take questions. I know I've seen a lot of questions go by in the chat box. Um, and more than I can probably ask <laughs> right now, but I know um, Greg had a question and he wanted to ask about the flag. Um, so I thought we'd go ahead and, and talk about that a little bit. The flag has been something that um, we've gone back and forth about. Um, and Ann and Steven, I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, we haven't decided if, if we're gonna use a United States flag or a USCT flag yet. Um, Ann, would, would you like to talk about that? Yes, thank you, Heather. It's been 
you know, as, as, as Stephen has noted, and, and, and we all have, that we, one, one of the aspects that we desire most for the sculpt, sculpture to affect is conversation. And the flag has been a conversation point. Um, our thinking, if it is, well, A, Stephen is designing it such that the flag can change. The flag will be a real flag. That was, I mean, it will be, it's not going to be bronze is what I'm trying to say. And from the very start, that's been critical to Stephen, that it was, that it was a flag of, of fiber. Um, and yes, the historicity of the piece is very important to us with the, all the research of the names of the USCT that served in the Wilmington campaign. So, to for the work to serve as a document of history, yes, is it has been extremely important to Stephen and to all of us participating. But works of art oftentimes have the fluency of not being tied strictly to a point in time. And we've touched on that today, how much this work commemorating the heroism of these men from February 20th to 21st, 1865, still, I mean, to Stephen's point, is, is still so contemporary here in 2020. And so there was an argument to be made that perhaps the work seated as a document in history is carrying us to the present and to the future. And we've had current veterans talk about the meaning that the work has for them. They were not USCT, but they are, they are service people today. And, this, and the work resonates for them as well. So that was one part of the argument. And then others feel that it needs to be seated firmly in that moment in time with the flag. And Heather, you wanna pick up with some of the research with the, uh, the flags that the USCT bore. We've, we're continuing to learn. Right, so um, I have been researching who makes USCT flags is one thing, um, and also which USCT flag would be the most appropriate um, for um, this particular sculpture. The fifth USCT led the charge. Um, most of the USCT that fought here were in the 5th Regiment. Um, so the historians that I have talked to have recommended that we use the, um, the flag for the 5th USCT. And then there is, there is a collective USCT flag as well. Didn't you just recently discover that? Yes, um, someone told me recently that there was a, a national USCT flag, so we're looking into that as well. So. So we discussed the use of the different flags for different points of interpretation. If we were having seminars about, about the service of the men during the time or so um, it's, a, it's a very open conversation. Um, money does come to bear with all of this, this to, to erect even a sculpture in bronze of one figure is not for the faint of heart. And our sculpture, Stephen is creating 11 figures. And then with Heather's research, there are individuals that sew historic flags, but they are extraordinarily expensive. And there's nothing to protect this. It can easily be removed from the, um, the color bearer's hands. So it's not the most defining aspect, but it's certainly a sobering one to think of, of costs every step of the way. Stephen, you want to weigh in with the uh, philosophy about the flag, a symbolism of the flag? I think you answered everything. It was well spoken. <laughs> I think well, we're, we're excited by the possibilities of, of both. Yeah. And so Heather put together a confab here at the museum. Oh Lord, was it last October, Heather? It seems like a thousand years ago. And we had county commissioners present, Mayor Bill Sappho was here, and oh, the conversation was so sparky. And Mayor Sappho just suggested that we could change out the flag depending upon the purposes that we needed. 
and I, I, I thought that was very, very diplomatic of him as a politician. <laughs> I love how Stephen um, Stephen has often said um, that the USCT sculpture is is more than just a moment. He says it's it's then, it's the past, it's the present, it's the future, and and that's what you know the casting of the descendants and the reenactors um, give the sculpture. It's this line of strength and honor um, and striving forward um, for social change and social justice that I think he captures so beautifully. Um, and, and that's part of why the, the United States flag, it seems like it's this thing that we're reaching for, right? Um, but um, so that's still a work in progress. We have lots of questions about research. I hope I get some research volunteers from this group. I see that some of my volunteers are here. Um, so yes, we do know the regiments that were there. Um, we have looked in the cemetery in Southport. Um, and I saw that our public historian, Devin Kelly, was she's, she was in here a while ago. I don't know if she's still here, but um, so one of the things about the way um, ancestry research is structured right now. And also someone asked if we had re reached out to the African American Civil War Museum, we have. Um, it's very easy to look, or it's easier, it's not very easy, it's easier to look for an individual name than it is to look for an entire list of folks who are at a certain battle. And this was a, a fairly small battle. So what we're doing is we're looking at, we have a, a list of the 5,000 names um, of people who could potentially have been here from um, the regiments that were here. We know from a historical letter um, that it was referenced that 1,600 men fought at the Battle of Forks Road. I believe there were 6,000 in the Wilmington campaign. Um, so we're going through the list of 5,000 to look at muster rolls um, and to go painstakingly through Simone's here. She's doing it. Um, to find out who was here and who wasn't. Um, so that's where we are in that process. And, um, you know, it's it's um, a new bit of history that we're uncovering. And I know that we'll uncover so many stories, so many threads that will lead us um, somewhere else. So we're really excited about that. I'm trying to go through your questions. Um, we do have, I should say, because some of you have asked, how can I make a donation? Um, which is my favorite question. <laughs> uh, we've been working long and hard to raise money for this project. We do have generous support from Z. Smith Reynolds and from PNC, um, but you can purchase a paver um, that commemorates, you know, your name or someone in your families if you'd like, and that's on our website. And John McDonnell, who is our development director, has um, listed the link in the chat um, if you're interested. I can also post it on our Facebook page later, and it's on our website. Veronica, I love hearing that as an Army veteran, you look forward to the dedication. Thank you. We agree. The story needs to be told. Ah, Veronica is an African-American relative of a Buffalo soldier. Very cool. Fred, I don't know that answer about the number of USCT, but um, I can take it up with John Hank, the, the, the writer for the New York Times, if you'd like me to. So many questions um, and comments. Um, ah, here's a great, here's an interesting question. Steven, it's great to hear from you. I was wondering, have you ever been inspired by one of your students' work? Oh, Steven, you're muted. No, no, I'm never uh, inspired by any of my students' work. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I enjoy all everybody I encounter as far as my students. Each and every student inspires me in some some kind of way or form. Um, be that the way I the way I need to teach to improve my teaching or how I'm teaching, or even like learning different mediums uh, to to show them how to use different materials. So uh, I'm always inspired by a student. You know, it, it's 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 good to be a teacher. But it's also best to be able to be able to learn from them as well. Like you're not doing anything if you're not learning at the same time, or either at the end of the day, you're just doing the same thing over and over. So 
I enjoy learning from them and teaching them at the same time. So I'm always learning. Thank you. And I know Steven's itching to get back into his studio at Duke and back in the classroom. Um, so Devin Kelly, our public historian is here and she answered the question about the regiments. The first, fifth, 27th and 37th were the regiments that were present at Forks Road. And so those are the regiments um, that we're going through right now to find out which of these men were here um, at Forks Road. There was after, after the fall of Wilmington, there were quite a few um, men that joined the USCT um, because the USCT came to town and um, were these amazing leaders. And so I think a lot of people in Wilmington um, decided to join the USCT at, at that point. Um, so that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out. Who, who was there at Forks Road and, and who joined after? Heather, um, if you don't mind, I wanted to add a little bit to that as well. Um, something that stuck out to me in my research as well about you know the USCT arriving in Wilmington is that um, a number of the soldiers that were in these regiments, like a, like a large number, were from the area. So when as they're marching into Wilmington they're actually like documented cases of like mothers being on the side and seeing their son for the first time in three months and running into the regiment and breaking up you know there's there's those types of reunions that are happening as they're marching into the city to recapture it and I think that that also would have contributed pretty heavily to who's joining up after you know they arrive because you're seeing your you know, if I if I see my cousin who I haven't seen in three or four years, you know, walk up and he's got this nice shiny uniform and like, you know, I'm 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 probably gonna be pretty interested in joining up with him and seeing what that life is like. So I just always thought that's really interesting and I like to I like to share that when I have the opportunity. Joel, thank you so, so much. I'm so glad you just you um, shared that story. And one of the people that um, I see that's here today is Carolyn Evans, and she's an African American storyteller that will be um, telling stories for us when we do do the dedication um, of the USCT sculpture. And that's one of the stories we want to tell. There is um, a Philadelphia, an African American Philadelphia paper reported that a woman was reunited with her son and the last time she had seen him he was a slave she didn't know where he went and he came back he was a man and he was in uniform marching marching into Wilmington it's an amazing story uh, Devin wanted me to tell everyone that she got her information from Chris Fonville's book um, the Wilmington campaign um, which we do have for sale in the shop <laughs> um, it's so wonderful to have all of you here today. Um, I don't see any more questions. If you have questions, please go ahead and ask them. Is there anything else that anyone else on the panel would like to say? Sonia? Steven? Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us and, and preserving this significant part of American history. United we stand as Thank a nation. You. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat box. Um, again, my name is Heather Wilson. Um, please feel free to email me if you have any questions um, or if you'd like to volunteer. Um, we're always looking for more volunteers and uh, we're so grateful. I can't tell you how thrilling it is to have 53 people, 54 people here today. We've never had a webinar with that many people and um, we're so excited about this project. Um, so thank you all for being here and um, keep in touch. Um, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.